Welcome, welcome to a new live uh, broadcast, uh, Radio Cine. We are beginning today with uh, special issues. We're going to be talking in Radio Cine about indigenous cinema, about uh, teaching uh, cinema or, and teaching through cinema. And uh, as we're doing it live, I'm going to review that we are broadcasting live and pass the link to our guest. If you are following us uh, through our social media, you know already who our guest is. And okay, I got it. And if you don't know it, we're gonna keep it like a mystery. No, I'm not keeping it like a mystery because we are seeing it, we are seeing him, but uh, it's... Uh, uh, okay. Uh, and mm, I, you got it, uh, dear guest, you got it through Facebook. And I'm going to send now the YouTube video. And when we'll edit this, this video, this introduction will disappear. Don't worry, but yes. Everything, everything seems to be working. This is so strange, but it's working. So, um... no, no worries. We're we're building suspense. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so important. You know it. <laughs> and uh, YouTube link, you got it. Who can be the, the, the guest with that voice, that powerful northern Ontarian voice? <laughs> and I've never okay. thought of myself as having a northern Ontario voice, but yes, I, but but I'm today sure I think I, I, today, uh, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> today I think you have it. Okay, I send it to you through Facebook, through uh, Gmail. I see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, then uh, let me do some work here too. Um, okay. Okay. It's done. We can talk. <laughs> Perfect. So we can start talking now with our guest uh, today, who is uh, a professor, uh, Tyson Stewart. Tyson, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, it started snowing here quite heavily. Oh. Uh, I, I got back from campus just uh, about an hour ago. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, now I think I'll just stay put. You're at North Bay. Uh, you teach at uh, Nipissing University, North Bay. I'm uh, at Toronto, and here it's raining a lot. So oh, yeah. that's the that's the difference. You could be also be in order, but uh, that's even uh, colder. And uh, well, that's what happens with uh, <laughs> that's what happens with the weather. But <laughs> today we wanted to talk some, but some different issues and some of them, of course, are about uh, cinema. Some of them are about uh, culture, indigenous culture. But uh, mm -hmm. first of all, uh, the other day, you know, I heard and I have heard some people talking about land acknowledgement. And uh, mm -hmm. when I first came to Toronto, um, I came for Toronto Film Festival. And uh, when I heard about the land acknowledgement, I said to myself, oh, this festival is fantastic. This is, this, nobody has thought about it, but that's related to the truth and reconciliation uh, committee on laws that had been um, have passed in Canada. What's the land acknowledgement, uh, Tyson? And should we do uh, like a land acknowledgement uh, today as we are uh, doing this, this broadcast? And uh, um, first of all, do you agree with the land acknowledgement? Because some people see it as uh, some hypothet hy mm, something that's not true. That's how do you see? Well, it? something that can become very uh, rote and um, mm -hmm. uh, lacks um, meaning if it's just performed uh, in a kind of more perfunctory nature. Mm -hmm. um, by you know folks who are introducing uh, 
whether it be a conference or an academic yeah. event or a film festival, mm -hmm. uh, we hear them often. They usually include a little bit of history about uh, indigenous settler relations, mm -hmm. um, the kind of responsibilities of being a guest on uh, an indigenous territory. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be very informative for, mm -hmm. as you say, people who are not familiar with them, yeah. who may not know that they're on um, like an indigenous traditional land where, mm -hmm. um, where the, there's a long history, often thousands of years long. Um, and and thousands. Sort of, yes. Sorry? 10,000, you said? Uh, so, well, in, in, in many cases, yes, it's more than 10,000. Wow. Yes, it's a um, lot of time, yeah. Indigenous presence. Mm -hmm. But um, they usually will include some reference to treaty. So political agreements mm -hmm. between Indigenous and settler societies to, um, in a sense, share responsibility and share the land. And mm -hmm. as many scholars have pointed out that a lot of those, most of those histories, uh, treaties were not um, upheld. And yeah, treaty, yeah, I know. Uh, broken. Uh, in this area, we have a, it's the um, Nishnabek of Nipissing First Nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the treaty that uh, covers this area is the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850. Uh -huh. And, um, but for over a hundred years, annuities have not been paid to, um, to indigenous members. Yeah. So uh, recently there has been a, um, a litigation um, sure. against Ontario to, um, to get back some of those uh, annuities and that it reflect current values. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I think I'm more, I'm personally more on like Cliff Cardinal's side. Um, yeah. <laughs> he, he wrote a very kind of interesting rebellious little play um, uh -huh. based on um, Shakespeare's As You Like It. But in fact, when uh, the play begins, he comes out and does a land acknowledgement and he goes on and on and on for over an hour. And mm -hmm. instead of the play, you get the world's longest land acknowledgement, essentially, and going into depth about, um, uh, you know, genocidal uh, colonial tactics that um, mm -hmm. have sought to really um, assimilate or in some cases erase indigenous presence from these lands. Uh -huh. So it, it's, there it is there. Um, mm -hmm. It just won the governor general's prize for uh, drama. And mm -hmm. I think I, I will be teaching it next term in my indigenous resistance and mobilization course. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'm, I, I, I like to question a little bit about uh, the terms we use in the, in the land acknowledgement, um, mm -hmm. this idea that uh, settlers are, are have an opportunity to live and work here, yeah. and um, that they are guests, um, but we all know that settlers have forcefully taken the position of host mm -hmm. long time ago, and mm -hmm. haven't haven't upheld. Uh, treaty agreements and haven't um, yeah. so, sort of done their part um, in that relationship, that host guest relationship. Mm -hmm. It's fairly me meaningless to me uh, when those words are used uh, in such a rote fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and also the fact that we're not all um, members uh, of First Nations that are covered right. by treaty. So, mm -hmm. um, in the Tamagami case, yeah. uh, we have a very um, uh, sort of conflicting and and mm -hmm. complex relationship with uh, treaty mm -hmm. because it, the Robinson Huron Treaty was imposed 
on our yeah. community when yeah. when in fact we we still seek a treaty with uh, the government uh, uh, and we don't um, we didn't recog we weren't at that initial um, like our leadership I mean wasn't at that initial treaty um, signing uh -huh. so it makes it makes for an interesting sort of uh, political um, I, um, situation I suppose yeah. um, where um, we are uh, um, uh -huh. encouraged to you know respect and honor the treaty but um, but without going into the real history and the background of of um, uh -huh. The failures of, um, of 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 settler communities in yeah. relation to um, indigenous ones, all that history, the mm -hmm. genocidal part of yeah. Canada, assimilationist policies of the Indian Act, residential mm -hmm. school system, the reserve system, a lot of that um, uh, sought to uh, d disenfranchise mm -hmm. um, or to remove um or to take away the culture and the land uh -huh. so yeah um, and and that's another thing that is very interesting about uh land acknowledgements uh -huh. and they usually just um uh, sort of quickly uh references the land as something to be shared as something yes that I know. Uh -huh. we, we can both um sort of access and yes me the land acknowledgement um, fails to really um, tell us anything about the land itself and what mm -hmm. kind Why? of like, mm -hmm. yeah what kind of environment uh, we're yeah. in mm -hmm. um, and and it, it kind of I think um, looks upon the land as a commodity or mm -hmm. some value but mm -hmm. a vague kind of value that may not be really related to um you know uh sustaining life but rather mm -hmm. for like extracting resources so i you know i'm i'm not i'm never offended when someone skips the land acknowledgement i mm -hmm. it's not really my bag <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh... That's uh, curious. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you about, because uh, the other time we talked, you said you were from the Caribou clan. And I found even, and we're going to show it uh, now, that there's a, a Caribou clan uh, page of the Anishinaabe uh, group in Facebook. But uh, what is uh, the system of or what is a clan within uh, the indigenous uh, culture? Why do you identify yourself as a caribou clan? Uh, well, in my kind of traditional introduction, I would have said um, mm -hmm. Atik and Dodum. So I would have said that I'm from the caribou clan mm -hmm. uh, and from the Mogami First Nation. Uh, that is my. Um, that is my connection mm -hmm. um so the clan system was a seven point um governance system governance structure mm -hmm. and so each representative of each clan had a say in the de decision making uh and the kind of um health and policing of a, mm -hmm. of, a, of a community mm -hmm. And the role of the caribou clan um, is um, identity, love, and um, uh -huh. belonging. Mm -hmm. So um, they would of often be the ones that would accept someone new into the community. Um, mm -hmm. They would be there to um, accept them uh, or not, <laughs> and mm -hmm. or and. Um, Often you would do that in the, in a very hospitable fashion with food, mm -hmm. and and it would it would be um, the role of each clan member. So the Eagle Clan, 
would be like language and education. Mm -hmm. um, the turtle clan would be justice. Bear would be medicine and policing um, and, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. you, if you came from one of these clan uh, families, uh, mm -hmm. then that was, um, that was basically how you would um, take your role and, and how you would find your role within the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we have part of the explainings of the Toro clan, for instance. But, uh, well, it's, it's good to know. Um, but uh, Tyson, one of the problems is that, uh, well, you know, better than me, that uh, through the years, there's been like, um, you said it before, genocidal and uh, also and not only the annihilation of the people, but of the culture through the residential schools. The, the idea was to forbid you indigenous people to talk your language and to transmit your values. So how do you now convey those indigenous traditional values through culture, cinema, or how do you do it? Uh, how do you convey them to your students? Well, <laughs> I'm, I, I like that question a lot. Uh, it's a challenging question. Um, mm. I'm, I don't see myself personally as um, being able to repair uh, yeah. all the damage wrought by residential schools, for example, or mm -hmm. um, like the intergenerational traumas that um, that resulted from that. Mm -hmm. um, I see myself as playing a supportive role in cultural resurgence, regeneration, mm -hmm. um, and through my passion and love of film mainly, um, I'm able to share um, the stories and values, the seventh generational thinking, um, mm -hmm. thinking about future generations and past generations and how, you know, the past and the future mm -hmm. can, can kind of coexist mm -hmm. in a, in a nonlinear kind of way, um, through stories that, um, Uh, really challenge uh, linear ideas of, of temporality. Mm -hmm. So like a film like Night Raiders, for example, which is uh, Daniel yeah. Goulet's uh, science fiction dystopian mm -hmm. film. There's some really great um, uh, sort of um, overlapping timelines, blurring mm -hmm. timelines. It begins with the narration of a character who is a descendant of all those characters we see in the film, which mm -hmm. already takes place in the future. So it's very much thinking about uh, how the past inf informs the future and, um, and just basically challenging our expectations of, mm -hmm. um, uh, of what we understand in the, in the present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One one of the, as we talked previously in other interviews, it's one of the uh, most expensive indigenous uh, films. And uh, even so, of course, it's not comparable to, well, what uh, Hollywood is spending right now on Marvel movies or on some movies like uh, the last one. Uh, that uh, Martin Scorsese has done, and um, and with this, I think perhaps we're going into the your top five movies of the year. Or how do you see? Is is it one of the best five movies of the year for you? Uh, you want to do that now? <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know. And then we well, close the interview. No, because it's, it would be too short. But uh, I was wondering, uh, how do the indigenous films relate to uh, films from non-indigenous filmmakers like Scorsese? 
who Great. deal with uh, indigenous subjects. And as you said about uh, Night Raiders, and uh, well, that, that led me at least to talk, I would like to talk about flowers, uh, flowers, killers of the flower moon, isn't it? Okay, sure. So just to say, just to say briefly though about uh, Night Raiders, because I'm seeing it on the screen here. Yes. That, um, it is a very dark film. It is dystopian, mm -hmm. but um, there's so much. Um, it's kind of uh, backloaded in a way. Mm -hmm. the The film gains a lot of um, sort of. Um, notions about cultural yeah. revitalization mm -hmm. and um the the cree language becomes more mm -hmm. prominent in the second half mm -hmm. and it it actually repeats a lot of our what we've already gone through in terms of our colonial history in canada mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in the future there's these there's this military state that is abducting, mm. kidnapping children and putting them into the academy to turn them into soldiers and to assimilate them and to, um, you know, turn them into basically, um, you know, this this homogenous culture. And mm. so the film is like repeating, doing the whole residential school experience yeah. all over again, but in the future. Um, much like uh, what Cherie Demoline does in The Marrow Thieves, which is a best-selling um, sci-fi book as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's these great moves to um, look differently, look at um, our history, mm -hmm. but in new contexts, uh, focusing on new characters, new situations, but mm -hmm. it's the humanity it's the um it's the resistance to those kinds of oppressive um uh, actions that mm -hmm. that really i think um blend the the history or where mm -hmm. history becomes more poignant mm -hmm. um yeah. by by just looking at looking at it uh, askance mm -hmm. and like a little bit differently in a new new uh, environment but um but nonetheless repeating a lot of the the history that we've already lived through mm -hmm. so and and with the the group that lives off the land mm -hmm. with their teachings becoming coming back and mm -hmm. with uh, the cree language having a very big presence in the in yeah. that film um it's it's great that you say that it's one of the most um uh you know production wise it it had a lot of support and they it it cost quite a lot of money and you you can see it um yeah. it looks fantastic and that those ai drones become mm -hmm. a very important part of the 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 narrative and for that young character who has this connection with animals mm -hmm. and with the land and um and any and she respects life that way mm -hmm. so the uh the twist at the end i don't know if you've seen it but it, it has to do with um whether or not we can can listen and whether or not we can um live in mutual reci reciprocity with the land mm -hmm. and, yeah yeah, yeah. So that's, I, that's, I think... <laughs> that's a that's a that's a question that's something you can talk to before and uh, that's something i always been thinking i've been thinking about because uh, sometimes i wonder and uh, this will connect later with yeah. my question with her scorsese but whenever you want to but sometimes no, no, I, wonder, I will. Yeah. No, no. Sometimes I wonder if we talk about how do indigenous people have a relation with the land, because it's it's convenient for for us. And I'm and saying us, and I'm including that group. And I don't know uh, what what that group wants to. But maybe it's like uh, when we want to do something about the land, we have the excuse, or we use like the vision that you don't have 
uh, it's like this. You, you talk about it also when you talk about the opposition between rural and um, and when you're living in the the country. Yeah. Yes, yes, because it's a, a difference that I think sometimes we use it from the from Toronto, from the GTA area, from the big urban medium. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very different when you live or when you have that feeling of connection with your community or with mm -hmm. your clan and that relation with the, with the land. Is it, is it like, like that? Because I feel like sometimes we say, oh, we want to have a relation with the land like the indigenous, but in reality, we don't live it like that. Uh, no, I think it's a challenge for everybody. Um, yeah. and, and we can't really go back to the heyday of... Uh, of when things uh, were completely uh, natural and there was no pollution and no, mm -hmm. no mercury poisoning mm -hmm. in, in the lakes and in the fish that we eat. Mm -hmm. um, the air was cleaner. We can't go back to living mm -hmm. off the land per se, but yeah. we can live off of, we can partly do that, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be through harvesting um, the, um, mm -hmm. Uh, or foraging uh, plants and berries and um, uh, harvesting moose yeah. and deer and, and, and things like that that mm -hmm. are still very much uh, a part of the uh, northern way of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and that still is ingrained completely into our communities about mm -hmm. the values of only taking what is absolutely necessary, leaving um, mm -hmm. enough for others, uh, killing a bull instead of the mother, uh, the cow, mm -hmm. uh, so that you're thinking about uh, future generations being able to uh, also live and thrive. Mm -hmm. And um, and that, that whatever we take from the moose, we uh, definitely um, we share it amongst family and friends. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I think living off the land is can can happen in many different ways, um, and and navigating the land uh, also would uh, entail kind of bringing back the canoe and bringing back uh, our modes of transportation that uh, were essential for this part of uh, uh, Turtle Island. Um, so there, there's efforts to do that and to reclaim those, um, uh, those skills mm -hmm. uh, for living off the land. But um, if you're asking me personally how much I live off the land, I go camping for a week in the summer. <laughs> like yeah. I'm not, I'm not uh, a traditionalist in that sense, so I I can only um, speak with um, you know people who harvest, people mm -hmm. who um, forage to learn from them what where I can go and 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 what communities I can I can do that in, um, but I'm not um, I'm not doing this year round like some people. Yeah. Yeah, I. But I, I think it's fantastic when I think it's absolutely fantastic when you can do that. Yes, but uh, in addition, if uh, you do it, you don't teach or you don't uh, devote your time to to cinema. It's like you have to to balance and uh, well to acknowledge some different things. So, uh, well, I'll tell <laughs> I, you, I think I mean, it'd be difficult. Still, but, uh, yeah. You can still learn a lot. I mean, teaching and. Mm -hmm just um, through our kind of te technological environment. Yeah. Um, I just finished today teaching an independent study course for the last 11 weeks or so mm -hmm. on, on moose, moose management, moose studies, and the importance of um, the hoof clan in traditional storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So all of that course, the bulk of it, except for the last meeting took place online. Mm -hmm. So you can still you can still learn what what skills and what um, uh, what you would need to know to to then transfer into a more land based uh, lifestyle. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging my student to, to create a social media account where they can uh, teach uh, everyone what they are doing on the land, uh, because this student in particular wants to go back um, mm-hmm. and, and create a um, sort of a, a, a cabin and a, a year round place where they can yeah. live um, in, in the oh. bush. So it's, it's fantastic, but they really want to, you know, communicate that. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm encouraging that part of it. Mm-hmm. Are they then like uh, creating projects uh, fostered by ju- what they learn in your classes? Are they trying to recover indigenous knowledge, indigenous way of, of living through the transmission of uh, indigenous culture? Uh, we both are. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're yeah. both learning how, to, how that works and mm-hmm. uh, how important it is to um, take our relationships with animals seriously as mm-hmm. a sacred um, treaty, in a sense, because mm-hmm. we, in our stories and in our teachings, we had treaties with the land, with the animals, with the water, mm-hmm. with the rock before we had treaties with settlers. And Mm -hmm. if you ask me, those connections that are based on reciprocity and um, uh, so we put down tobacco when we take moose or even some blueberries, Mm -hmm. um, whatever we can do to uh, honor um, the land in that kind of exchange where we're not being greedy Mm -hmm. we're just taking in a kind of very critical a very informed way we're taking only what is necessary yeah and and um but there are obstacles to that today with Mm -hmm. um you know borders and uh provincial legislations and policies and um sort of the presence of uh hunters that um, Mm -hmm. might disturb some of those uh, attempts to manage um, animals and moose in Mm -hmm. particular. Um, So in Quebec, they have uh, like a ticket system where they can basically buy as many tickets as they want to to hunt moose. Uh Um, And that can kind of interfere with uh, indigenous values that are based on taking only what is needed. Oh, that's that's an interesting system. Do you know it? That's but that's only for for Quebec. It's like, uh, well, lots of things in in Canada that only happening in Quebec, and the rest uh, it hasn't been uh, put in place in the rest of Canada, isn't it? There are there there's a lot of differences. Like more yeah. generally speaking. Uh, they don't really have a history of peace treaties. So mm. any kind of attempt to uh, work yeah. with indigenous communities, mm-hmm. um, well, often um, they, they pay lip service to, to their kind of consultation with indigenous groups, but there's really, there's, there, there's not a strong... Um, sort of a push to uh, recognize um, the the kind of the full um, mm. the full shared responsibility there mm. I guess so yeah I, I understand and uh, well regarding like this relation uh, between different uh, communities do we get to talk? about uh, Killers of the Flower Moon? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> what? So, uh, because I read mm-hmm. on, on social media precisely, I, I read one of your posts and uh, you really, really like it. Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah I like it. I, I like it a lot. Um, mm-hmm. I think uh, I think Scorsese um, went about it 
in a very interesting way mm-hmm. um, by um, seeking their the Osage's um, counsel and yep. uh, advice very early on uh, shaped the overall project and the, especially the finished product that we see mm-hmm. now yeah was greatly informed by their um their leadership mm-hmm. and their cultural advisors um from what i understand it is sets a new standard for uh, mm-hmm. cross-cultural collaboration and working mm-hmm. with indigenous mm-hmm. communities on on filmmaking um so hired a lot of costume designers, um, uh, language um, experts, um, and and the fact that the screenplay was rewritten before filming, before mm. production, to 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 uh, center um, that very. Um, uh, you know, frustratingly um, complicated <laughs> relationship between Ernest, I guess, and Molly, um, I think was the right, the, the right move. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there are a lot of like Scorsese flourishes throughout um, the beginning uh, montage done in black and white about mm-hmm. Uh, the wealth in the Osage yeah. Nation because they struck oil, um, and how they were basically very rich <laughs> and uh, very um, um, different, I should say, uh, mm-hmm. compared to like most First Nations and Indigenous. Uh, communities in that regard so it really um i think there's a line in the film where you know mm-hmm. it, it put a target on their their back the the blanket became a target mm-hmm. um for those who wore it so and then um giving a little bit of that background and a general sense of that conspiracy Mm-hmm. to uh, to eliminate the matriarchs of the Osage nation um, was, I think, typically Scorsese mm-hmm. in, in the sense that he wants to give you a full um, a full um, sort of in- scan of the criminal activity going on in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, this place um, and there's there's similar you know insightful um, um, uh, whether it be like montages or mm-hmm. voiceovers yeah. in in casino in goodfellas mm-hmm. that also um, go into uh, that those particular um, crime organizations Hmm. um but what is what is i think really uh, great about killers is that it it does become um so focused on those two characters Mm -hmm. and their their relationship and how that plays out um with all of these other forms of exploitation happening at a more societal level Mm -hmm. um it's really i think um agile in terms of how it balances those two um those two topics like the the personal um Mm -hmm. relationship that is sort of um um from the beginning um It, it's it's uh, you know set set to fail, mm-hmm. um, and and at at a more at a more societal level, um, you have crimes that could not um, could not happen without um, the without the backdrop of. 
um, a very a, a very racist society. Yeah. Um, one that um, you know swallowed hook, line, and sinker the mm -hmm. myth of the dying culture or the dying Indian, mm -hmm. uh, and and that would have been um, very per pervasive um, ideology about the um, uh, sort of the the competence of settlers in the frontier, creating the West, um, settling in, um, in the middle of the country um, in the late 1800s mm -hmm. after the Trail of Tears or, you know, coinciding with that. Um, the, there is this pervasive ideology mm -hmm. that Indigenous people are situated in the past. So mm -hmm. I think the, the, the beginning montage about the wealth and the, the thriving culture mm -hmm. um, contrasts beautifully with all of those uh, pernicious ideologies. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it almost ups the ante or um, uh, raises the stakes for Scorsese to mm -hmm. not only um, focus in on one criminal organization or group, mm -hmm. um, like in, frankly, some of my favorite films, Goodfellas is, is yeah. right up. No. Um, but um, to, uh, to make it about American, the original sin of America, which is the exploitation of Native Americans mm -hmm. and the genocidal, um, the the actions to yeah. um, wipe out and to displace and to disconnect and basically to assimilate mm -hmm. um, in Native Americans um, makes for, I think, an interesting bridge mm -hmm. um, between um like eight the 1800s and the 1900s mm -hmm. it, it, it may it, it almost fills a gap in mm -hmm. in film history itself mm -hmm. um and um because a lot of the early uh films with indigenous characters whether that be like Flaherty's Nanook of the North or Edward mm -hmm. Curtis's uh, In the Land of the Headhunters um, or uh, Burden's Silent Enemy. Um, a lot of those films were just like sort of pre-contact films mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. didn't really go into settler indigenous relations or conflict. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so this, this one, does it in a way that it feels more honest and truthful than mm. any Western I've seen, uh, mm. which is usually just a kind of glorification of the lone cowboy, the white male American navigating the, the frontier and kind of, um, uh, you know, um, overcoming all the obstacles, mm. including you know, n native tribes, things like that. And, and that is, that is what sort of American society placed a lot of value on in the forties and fifties, uh, was, um, not to say that there weren't, uh, films that question that kind mm -hmm. of mentality, but, um, yeah. they needed, uh, they needed to feel, um, justified and proud of the American dream. And mm -hmm. that westerns uh, were were basically the fuel of 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 the American dream for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 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 absolutely. They were the the foundation of even the the movie culture in some parts. And it's uh, uh, I remember that uh, talking with a, a director, um, a Spanish director, who said, "If you were an American director, you had to do a western." It's like uh, and uh, it seemed like it was necessary. Uh, lots of people are talking about uh, Lily Gladstone and uh, her performance in that movie, but uh, 
you know, I wanted to have your view because um, perhaps if an indigenous filmmaker would have done this movie, they would have done it from her point of view, which could have yeah. been more interesting, don't you think? I, I absolutely think that uh, I don't know, I don't want to presume what an indigenous filmmaker, how yeah. they would tell this story. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that she is magnificent mm -hmm. and heartbreaking. And I've only seen the film once when it first came out, mind you. But well, uh, well, that's that, uh, Tyson. That's more than enough. It's three hours and a half. Yeah, but <laughs> you I, see it I, twice. You need seven hours. Do you see yeah, it twice but... in the time that, <laughs> uh, well, it's Satan Tango, it's uh, seven hours, but uh, I don't know yeah. many more films. Well, love the arts films, but... Uh, I've, I've watched those films too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do want to see it again. There's yeah. no doubt I'll be, I'll be tuning in once it's on Apple. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's been such a success. Uh, I think at the movie box office mm -hmm. that there are still putting it on, on screens and, and you know it was kind of experiment for apple to do it on screens like to give it more prestige but it worked perfectly and uh, yes i i want to see it again of course in, in apple tv but it takes it takes mm -hmm. time so you need to see it twice like to uh, evaluate yeah. it correctly i would prefer i'd prefer to see it twice especially mm -hmm. if i were to write about it or yeah you know offer more commentary or uh, teach it <laughs> eventually mm -hmm. at some point. I, I wonder how that'll go. But mm -hmm. uh, because it is a very dreary film for, uh, for the most part, mm -hmm. uh, it, has a, it has a certain stubborn pace that it, it, it's working through um, the, the, this drama. Um, in terms of um, yep. hit, hitting those emotional notes, um, there's a lot of space in between uh, the violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, upon second viewing, I'll be interested to see if I experience like a different sense of the pace of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, knowing knowing what's going to happen uh -huh. um, i i want to i just you know for my own you know appreciation of it uh -huh. um i want to see if those that first hour uh kind of holds up and to uh, to to yeah. the point of really effectively um building the suspense and also um, um, offering mm. enough background information mm. um, but ab about the Osage, about the kind of American mm. um, history uh, that, in, that, um, that is trying to kind of intervene in, mm. uh, in in a telling of, of American history um, that I think is completely new on the screen. Yeah. So yeah. like at this time, you know, Edward Curtis is mm -hmm. um, making photographs of Native American life mm -hmm. in very kind of artificial um, uh with an artificial approach, mm -hmm. often reusing the same sort of headdresses and um, clothing and uh, framing people in a way that um, suggests they're like walking into the distance, mm -hmm. that they're about to disappear uh, back to the camera often um, on horseback uh, without any kind of reference to modernity uh, mm -hmm. or kind of modern living uh, or towns even. So I know that 
that was his images were very carefully uh, selected to communicate uh, an idea of um, uh, of of a dying civilization, uh -huh. and and so that those ideas I think to have a film that says no, um, uh -huh. there nothing is nothing is just dying. Uh -huh. um, that there are real antagonisms and real. Uh -huh. um, forces that come in at like the everyday citizens mm -hmm. participating in um, the erasure and the murder of indigenous people. Um, there's, there's that scene near the, in the middle where the, um, the man goes to his lawyer and just asks him frankly, um, you know, how can I get the money? How can I get the title rights from my wife? Would I have to kill my children? And just stone face, completely serious mm -hmm. and completely uh, willing to do it. Um, and, and to me, it's like, that's the, that's the change is that you see how everyday um, Americans who have bought this, uh, bought this ideology um how they would talk and behave and 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 be in the world mm -hmm. and it it and he doesn't really have to shine uh, a light on it or he doesn't have to make a big spectacle of it but, yeah. but a lot of the dialogue in this film is um is is so like disgusting that the mm -hmm. things that yeah. they're they're planning and talking about and uh, calculating uh, uh, in 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 terms of how they're going to um, get away with this big con, um, mm -hmm. it's just it's it's revolting to think about that people so casually um, did these things, mm -hmm. um, and I think that is where the dread comes in the dreariness mm -hmm. it's not always a entertaining film mm -hmm. yeah it is very much <laughs> and i don't really like this word but it's an important film yeah and it's hard to watch um mm -hmm. and in that sense uh schindler's list was hard to watch mm -hmm. yeah um, it was it was a challenging film Mm -hmm. aesthetically and uh in terms of its um portrayal of um mm -hmm. you know the ghetto and uh, yeah. the camps and um sort of the absurdity of mm -hmm. uh of the whole mm -hmm. situation and the yeah. kind of nazi um mm -hmm. uh you know they're just so their arrogance yeah. um it, I know it's not, it's not a I, film that you would think of. Well, let's put this on yeah. Sunday morning or whatever, or yeah. <laughs> for an an enjoyable uh, time. But um, I think mm -hmm. I I like the fact that Scorsese seems to mm -hmm. throw caution to the wind at this point mm -hmm. in his career, and mm -hmm. he's making uh, dra drama out of. Um, a history that I knew very little about, and I think mm -hmm. most yes. most uh, North Americans will not have known this history either. No, absolutely. And, and, and it's just seen. It just seems to come fully um, fleshed out. Yeah, yeah. I know Schindler's List is one of your favorite movies. So yeah. uh, for me that uh, you compare both, it's both illuminating, it sh sheds light to, to the film and then just the comparison is interesting, but also makes me wonder about uh, how much you like this film. And even though you haven't seen it uh, uh, twice, uh, would it be 
I'm not going to do you. I'm not going to ask the next question. Okay. The next question is going to to appear in the screen. Oh. <laughs> is it on the top five movies of the year so so far? And this is a question also for our audience. What are your top five movies of the year uh, so far? Because uh, you know there are still uh, some I think good movies to to be released. Um, I'm not qualified to really answer this, but. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do watch, I do tend to see, see movies and yeah. I am a programmer at the North Bay Film Festival. Um, mm -hmm. So I see movies there as well. Um, I'll do this. I'll do this, Antonio, if, if you, uh, if you do this with me. Um, as, as you can see, I have you two ready to look for your top uh, five. Now we have a uh, killers of the, Flower Moon, I'll try to help you because so far I was wondering, uh, okay, we have to establish the rules because, yeah, sure. because, uh, uh, you know, I've seen one film I like a lot. Well, it happens to be Spanish. Okay. But, uh, uh it's been Great. screened only at TIFF. It hasn't been widely released. So, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know for you, but for me, that's more than enough. <laughs> but uh, anyway. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, flowers, it's, it's a film we've seen. The top five? Yeah. A film we've seen in the last 12 months. No, that's okay. the... Yes, that's, that's the it. Idea. That's the rules. So okay. we, can include, we can include uh, um, half November of uh, 2022. Okay. So let me just uh, say that uh, this is not in alphabetical order. Or not in, <laughs> not in, uh, you know, any kind of hierarchy. Yes, uh, it's it's so, not the Oscars. You're not no, uh, saying like the finalists are and the Oscar goes to. It's not. Very, very randomly. So okay. let's. I'll I'll start. Killers of the Flower Moon by Martin Scorsese. Okay. This this Your looks turn. like the, the this looks like the nomination when they say, "Oh, these are the nominees from the uh, Academy Academy North Bay Academy." So Flowers is sure. nominated. Okay. There's Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, he looks sad, but he should be happy because he's uh, nominated. Okay. I don't know if um, like like historically, I, I do think it raises that kind of awareness. Yeah. Uh, so that's the comparison to Schindler's List. There's also like tonal mm. things and mm. um, the fact that we're, we're talking about difficult subject matter. Yeah. But I'm very interested to see, like for mainly political reasons, um, mm -hmm. the kind of awards um, response to Killers. Mm -hmm. And I don't, know if it, I don't know if it's, it would necessarily be a good thing if it repeated what Schindler's List did. Mm -hmm. We'll see. We'll see. That that that. I don't, I don't know it will. I don't know it will perform so well in the Oscars. I don't. I don't think I it will. My, I have my. I have this too. Yeah. To be yeah. frank. Yeah. Okay. Um, your second film, or now it's my first film. It's what your is, first you, you decide. It's, it's your. It's your award ceremony. You what? You pick one film that okay. we need to see. <laughs> okay. Uh, well. Uh, the holdovers. Uh, you know, Alexander Payne usually is a very interesting uh, filmmaker. And um, not only because he's been taught by one of my aunts, but that counts, of course. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I think in, in this case, it seems like uh, this, for me, this kind of movies that are very interesting in which something seems like to be evolving very slowly. Mm -hmm. And it goes to a very powerful ending. Nice. But what happens during the film, it's it's very important. And for me, it's very important having people who are doing the right things. Because now we don't have like uh, heroes in the, well, Flowers of the Killer Moon. It's, 
Killers of the Flower Moon, no Flowers of the Killer Moon. Killers of the Flower Moon. There are that, that's the no. sequel. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that, absolutely. But uh, mainly in politics, they are not heroes at all, and we need like some roles, even if, uh, well, some things happen when you do the good things. But uh, uh, for me, you have to search, you have to look deeper into people, and that's what <laughs> this film is about about uh, getting to know each other. And oh, nice. That's, that's important. That's, that could be even related to uh, getting to know indigenous culture and getting to know people at the end because you can't judge, well, the same, you can judge a book by its cover. And, uh, well, that for me was fantastic about Holovers. I'm, I'm very, very delighted to hear that you liked it. So mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. But um, I'm going to definitely seek it out now. I've always liked Alexander Payne uh, since, uh, really, since election. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I, I have a soft spot for films about cranky professors. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is definitely a, a film you, you, have to, you have to see. So number two. My, uh, my number two, okay. Your number uh, two, yes, your number two. Well, because you had mentioned that Facebook post earlier um, yeah. where I, I talked about killers, um, I'll go with Jules Kostachin's uh, Wapaki, um, uh, which is um, a documentary mm -hmm. uh, about um, Jules's mother. Mm -hmm. who uh, attended residential school. Uh, they are from Attawapiskat, they're Cree. And uh -huh. um, her mother details um, her experiences being uh, taken to uh, a residential school, the mm -hmm. treatment she received there, the yeah. lack of love, uh, lack of, um, you know, proper caring and nutrition um, and also the film becomes a uh, sort of meditation uh, by uh, children or descendants of uh, re of residential school um, survivors in, in terms of how that trauma often gets passed down to uh, the next generation. Yeah. or multiple generations in this case. And it was um, just a very uh, heartfelt and um, just super intelligent, uh, yeah. self-reflexive documentary. Um, the Most of the interviews are um, take place on a set where there are objects from ostensibly Jules's uh, home growing up mm -hmm. like um, like certain like food items and um, like blankets and things moccasins um, and and it projected behind our images uh, of residential school of their family histories and um, I mean she's she's just become so adept, I think, in her uh, storytelling abilities in the documentary mode, um, and in in frankly in fiction as well. Uh -huh. uh, but I thought this one was very powerful. That it it also um, focuses on uh, people that are not a part of her family. Mm -hmm. who also have similar experiences and who kind of all, all, all of these subjects kind of come together around mm -hmm. a fire or around in a circle to share their, um, their, their pain and to um, empower one another to mm -hmm. tell their story. And um, it's, it just gets very, uh, it's it's not the most it's it's not the most um, obvious film um, mm -hmm. about about indigenous families, 
there yeah. there are some um some critical moments and moments of where you have to break where you have to make different decisions where you mm -hmm. have to behave differently than what your a family and sometimes even community expects mm -hmm. and i thought that was very brave of her to um explore those feelings that um and i hope it's cathartic as well that she can move on in a sense and just be creative uh and and keep sharing her stories for all of us absolutely absolutely very interesting uh, filmmaker and very interesting film uh, that's uh, uh well part of the mm, films produced by the national film board uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, the institution that uh, promoted the first uh, indigenous films with uh, um well, in the oh. 60s uh, or around like that. And, uh, okay, so now it's my turn. It's your turn. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's... You this was going to be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, would, I would tell you now, uh, close your eyes. And uh, but not not close. No, it's the film. It's the film is close your eyes. You don't have to close them. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, uh, you know that um, in Spain uh, there's a filmmaker is uh, Victor Erice uh, who's uh, uh, well he's done um, since 1973. He's done yeah. four films, and oh, yeah. uh, all of them have been considered by the critics like uh, masterpieces. This last one, I think there was one person, yes, but it was one friend of mine who didn't say so, but he received critical award, critical acclaim in, uh, Can at Cannes Festival. And it's somehow related with what you said. Of course, it's it happens in Spain. It's not uh, related with indigenous uh, peoples, but with uh, remembering and even forgetting with uh, cinema, with Mm, his creative process because uh, the film is very related with um, what uh, happened to Victor Arise with his uh, previous film which was cancelled by the producer and then was given to another filmmaker it's Fernando Trueba who's a very good one but uh, well it's uh, um, I think like a perfect uh, resume it could be like a presentation of who has been Victor Arise, why it's cinema important, and uh, what can cinema convey, transmit, and show us about uh, life, about people, about feelings, and even about uh, wanting to live uh, our own lives and to live some others' lives, maybe. So, <clears throat> well, classical, right. very, um, like... Uh, interesting pace and uh, with uh, well great filmmakers there was Anna Torrent there who would he discovered uh, 40 years ago and uh, there's a shot in which there is a steady shot just she talking to the camera and well absolutely incredible so mm -hmm. I, I like it a lot it was uh, uh, well a miracle, uh, they say at uh, Cannes Festival, and uh, and uh, Le Mans. But uh, well, for Melodies uh, en français, uh, and in France it's uh, already been premiered. But uh, your third film, uh, have you have seen uh, this of the list? What's your your third film? What is the bronze award, which is not bronze, but what's the third one? Thank, thank you for doing this, by the way. This is this is amazing. Yeah, um, I have you. to see more of um, uh, what was it, Irise? Yes, mm, I can I can tell you through a a message. Uh, yeah. it's uh, uh, so I was uh, questioning and is uh, Victor Irise? It's, well, I mean, I. Uh, e -er uh, it's like this. Uh, you'll see it. Yeah, no, I can I can find it. Um, Your top five movies of the year so far, and this is Victor Erice. 
beautiful. And uh, I can I can do it also that we can put like the name of the filmmakers so we have a Scorsese. I think that's a good um, <clears throat> approach, by the way, to yeah. like film career. Take your time. <laughs> if you can, if you can, I mean, if you if you have uh, the, the the kind of finances in order, um, and you can make a film for mm -hmm. you know a long period yeah um, i mean it's you can really tell between those films filmmakers that churn out a film a year mm -hmm. and those that um you know take five six years in between mm -hmm. i think there's something to be said about you know um killing your darlings and um yeah, you know, th thinking, spending a lot of time to think uh, mm -hmm. about your next project. Yeah, and you know, I have like an anecdote about uh, Erice because a dear filmmaker from Spain of mine was close friend of him, uh, late Javier Aguirre, and Javier was experimental filmmaker. He was doing always films, creating everything, and Erice is more like different well one film every 10 years sometimes because of him sometimes because of producers but he likes like having a different rhythm and then they met at the spanish cinematic and javier told him well i'm preparing this experimental film i'm preparing this avant-garde i'm writing this that and asking what are you doing and he says don't keep on talking and keep on talking because you're stressing me out. <laughs> yes, he was <laughs> just just listening to you, seeing you're doing so many things. No, no, no. I I have to relax, Javier. So that's that's the kind of of character, and yes, it's a, it's a luck that he's he has done this this film. So we have four names: Martin Scorsese, Alexander Payne. Joel Sarita Kustashin and Victor Rice. What's the fifth name? Well, I would add uh, Hirokazu Korida. Oh my, of film, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From uh, Monster. Yeah. Um, which is kind of like told in Rashomon mm -hmm. kaleidoscopic sort of structure. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, sort of. Um, replays the same um, events from three different points of view from mm -hmm. a, a mother who has learned that her uh, boy is being bullied at school mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and her effort to um, to uh, sort of find a solution with the, mm -hmm. uh, the teachers of the school mm -hmm. and then um, the event is then played from the teacher's point of view who gets mm -hmm. in I, um yeah that the teacher is the one who is um at the center of this kind of um uh investigation his behavior yeah. with with the student and mm -hmm. and then it, it it plays it from his point of view which is another like half hour or so mm -hmm. and uh, and then it culminates with a very long perspective of retelling mm -hmm. the events through the, the child's point of view. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, it was just very, it, it struck me as a movie that uh, had a very strong cumulative um, uh, impact mm -hmm. um, that uh, really... Um, A good example of you can't uh, always believe uh, your first appearances, or mm -hmm. um, or that it's <laughs> important to see things through other yeah. people's uh, eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and this was at Cinefest. This uh, Sudbury. Oh. This past mm -hmm. September, mm -hmm. um, there's some really kind of a jarring uh, 
aspects to this film, like in including like sound and music where you um, hear it out of context the first time and then mm -hmm. the second time yeah. you get the fuller context of, of what is going on. Um, and uh, and, and your, your opinion obviously really does change uh, when you get yeah. the full picture. Um, yeah. Because it starts out where, you know, the monster is obviously the teacher uh, mm -hmm. who, who has done something to this student. And, um, and, and then we learn more and more about uh, this relationship between these two boys um, and in a very unlikely uh, or unexpected ending, um, the 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 kind of conflict or the antagonism completely shifts, uh, and it, it stops being about these individuals per se, and more about um, s social um, expectations, how to kind of deal with uh, sort of childhood gayness i guess is yeah. is how i would put it yeah. um or queer behavior between between boys um and uh and and that becomes then the um uh the kind of breaking out of um all of these assumptions mm -hmm. But then there is there is also a sense of um, of melancholy that mm. characterizes it, and uh, yeah. I it's just the the impact of it at the at the moment uh, was very strong, and um, I've always liked Rashomon, and I never um, could never really uh, come up with or. Um, I, I never truly believed that they could outdo the the Kurosawa film, or how they could do a, a modern version of that it, mm. well. Uh, and and at the same time, it's a um, Koreeda version because the film is very Koreeda like. It's uh, what you said. He understands uh, what happens with each character. You get to know each person. And uh, mm. as you said, you think like, oh, this person is a monster, but then you get to know what happens behind. And it encourages you to to live that way. Very subtle, but uh, yeah. uh, it's it's Rashomon made by Koreeda without renouncing to be Koreeda, his view of life. It's very, very good film, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> that was uh -huh. one of your 40-something 40, 40 you saw at TIFF? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was one of the forty-four. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I seen that. Uh, well, this year I, I've been to Cannes like since twenty eleven to twenty twenty two. But this year I was in in Toronto. I haven't attended. And when I saw the lineup with flowers, uh, well, flowers, killers of the flower moon, flowers, we <laughs> said is like the sequel <laughs> with killers with uh, Corred and some other films. Well. I said I have to I have to see this one and also I don't know if you haven't seen if you have seen this other one but it this has been well I think it it has been quite of widely released and uh, it triumphed in um, Cannes and it's oh I know what you me yeah. what you say do you know what? You know what? Anatomy you know? shoot. <laughs> Anato anatomy of a fall. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's. It's. Uh, ha have you seen it? I have. Yeah. Wow. It's also talking about different perspectives. It's a, a, a film about the different perspectives, and well, <clears throat> we're not going to spoil the film. But there's a scene oh. when you get like to wonder. Is this what happened or what this character tells us that is happening? Because you live it exactly through what that character tells. So yeah. I think it's a film 
at the same time, it looks classic. At the same time, it's uh, very, very, for me, it's the best work Justine Tuyet uh, has done. Justine started with a film like the Battle of Solferino, and it was a very, very interesting, very honest, uh, down-to-earth film. I didn't like so much the next two ones, but this one, well, mm -hmm. I enjoy a lot. It's a great work, a great acting work. And, uh, mm -hmm. But also, the, the child is incredible because the actors, we knew it from Tony Ehrman, which is one of my favorite times, I think, ever. Favorite mm -hmm. films, I think, ever. But uh, it also makes you wonder a lot, makes you wonder even about creativity, about uh, living with a creative person. Uh, well, it's... Uh, very very interesting one and also a uh, long one because uh, i think lately films tend to be like uh, two hours this is two hour and a half but it, it's not like uh, it doesn't feel like a very long film so very very interesting interesting yeah one. i love how the first 20 minutes are con constantly referred to replayed yeah. re acted, relived, uh, and the editing in that film, I think, is so um, mm -hmm. be beguiling or something. It's, um, yeah. you, you're not cutting to people really for reactions that you would, mm -hmm. uh, that you would necessarily agree with or that yeah. you would expect, like, especially in those courtroom scenes between mm -hmm. the uh, prosecutor and the defense, mm -hmm. there's, um, there, th th that whole segment is, um, yeah, uh, kind of crazy in, in the way that it's such a, um, you know, civilized thing, a conversation almost, and yet they're, um, uh, they're bringing so much cultural baggage, so much um, uh, pre um, preformed sort of notions of mm -hmm. of authorship and and yeah. like being a writer. Um, yeah, and, 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 and such a different, a such a different judiciary system. You know, in in Spain, it's very different from what we know from. Uh, uh, U.S. Uh, movies because uh, in Spain uh, everybody like uh, advocates the jury. It's uh, very formal, but it's very different from this also because uh, this is like uh, when some witness comes, then they are asking again the the accusy. And uh, well, for me it was uh, shocking, but yeah. at the same time it's it's. I think it's very <laughs> well. It should be the the Switzerland. Uh, system, but it's very cinematic and uh, very powerfully yeah. done by the filmmaker. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I agree. So that is that your number three then? That is my number three, and I uh, I don't know if we can do it or if we should cut now because we uh, I should have finished. But uh, do you have two more, and we can I, do I it have two fast? More. I can... I can I can mention them just their the perfect. title. Perfect. Perfect. Let's go. Um, Sorry, Tyson, so, but uh, I, I would I would talk with you about twenty more, but <laughs> I should have <laughs> by now. Okay. Well, so what's the the fourth one? The it, it's War Pony by uh, Gina Gamel and Riley Cuff, mm -hmm. and it is about. Um, Two um, two stories told in sort of parallel, alternating between the experiences of a we got it. Lakota boy and a mm -hmm. Lakota man mm -hmm. on um, on a, I think it's the uh, I forget what the the reservation it's set on, but it's mm -hmm. it's a, oh Pine Ridge Re Reservation. Mm -hmm. And um, it is about uh, just a kind of really raw, gritty um, a slice of life uh, mm -hmm. on the reserve kind of depiction of, of um, you know, children being um, 
born into um, family that um, there's there's support system, mm -hmm. but there's also this kind of uh, macho desire to be mm -hmm. kind of gangster mm -hmm. to to have um, to have as many girlfriends as possible mm -hmm. um, to mm. um, to to be a kind of uh, a big shot in in the area mm -hmm. and but it also is very beautiful in terms of um, what binds the community mm -hmm. what brings them together um, it's fairly tragic mm -hmm. um, but also what um, essentially the things mm -hmm. that bind them are also the things that drive a wedge between them or that mm -hmm. um, um, create a um, uh, hard hard living conditions mm -hmm. um, the sort of racism that exists mm -hmm. on the borders of the reservation yep. that comes into play in a really great um, sort of suspenseful buildup near near in the second half. Um, it's a film that gets better as it goes along mm -hmm. because you you think that it's just going to be these really um, uh, sort of um, br bright uh, yeah. anecdotes, the, these mm -hmm. really insightful uh, anecdotes about the life on the reserve. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's an actual story that fully takes over mm -hmm. and, and, and results in, a, I think, a really um, surprising and enjoyable mm -hmm. uh, act of defiance. Uh -huh. um, and the, these two characters, the boy and the, the young man, they never really uh, intersect throughout, but uh -huh. it's in that buildup where um, their lives become uh, entangled. Great. Uh, so uh, mm, we're very short of time, but uh, I want to talk yeah. to you about uh, The Promised Land. It's a film that's called in English, but in English originally in uh, Bastarden. It's Matt Mikkelsen, Matt Mikkelsen, which is uh, an actor uh, who I like better when uh, the movies have less budget because when the movies are inexpensive, he's like the good guy, and when movies are very expensive, he's like the <laughs> bad, bad guy. He's a very, very bad guy. He can be very, very bad when, well, in Marvel or James Bond movies, but uh, when he's a good guy, he's like wonderful. And uh, this film is like shows like the class of uh, classes, like the fight. Uh, we were talking about the, the land and uh, it's also a thing about how to work with the land and uh, uh, how um, some people or some politicians may take hold of the land uh, without even having or knowing what to do with it. So <clears throat> absolutely feel like uh, um, set in the 17th century with, uh, well, very John Ford style, but uh, with uh, some different approach to also all the characters, kind of Correa style, but the mm -hmm. bad guy which is in this movie is really, really, really a bad guy. But very interesting one. I, I could see it also in, in TIFF. It uh, was a screen in Venice, and I think it's going to be like uh, uh, the Danish uh, candidate for the Oscars. We'll see. I don't mm -hmm. think they'll take it, but it's an interesting one. So the last one, the fifth one. Um. Just going for pure enjoyment factor and nostalgia. Let's go. Let's enjoy. Yeah, yeah. Entertainment value. Uh, Seth Rogen's uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh. Animated. 
um, with a really distinctive style of animation, great mm -hmm. voice work. Um, it's, it's silly, it's enjoyable, uh, it's totally self-reflexive. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it, it just struck me as, uh, you know, perfect comedy. Mm -hmm. Right. It was a, I think it was a success in the box office. And there were, there were good reviews. I think Barry Hertz in the Global Mail did a good review. And well, it was like, uh, well, Pure entertainment, as you as you said, it's uh, okay. There, there, well, it has a it has a Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross uh, score, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that kind of um, like tone of like a menacing uh, synthetic score um, for the action sequences mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think brought it to another level for an, a children's film, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, it, it made it really um, intense mm -hmm. and um, I think uh, gave a certain amount of um, um, just extra, extra juice to mm -hmm. the, the action sequences. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I mean, of course, it's as comic book um, silly as as anything, um, but mm -hmm. it, the approach was as if it were directed by Christopher Nolan. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. it has a it, it it has a kind of um, sort of adult um, sensibility, mm -hmm. uh, and but the humor i think is will will cross the age differences very easily mm -hmm. there's a great sequence of a chase sequence where they repeat uh four non blondes mm -hmm. 90s hit what's up twice yeah uh, and it's it's maybe the most magical film going moment of the year for me Okay, so <clears throat> well, uh, now I'm. <clears throat> I'm trying to say about this. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to, to to find you. I'm thinking if I should say now Paw Patrol, but I, I haven't seen it. Paw Patrol. It's <laughs> it's a Canadian film also. Right. So, and uh, well, well I'm I'm seeing the um, box office and Killers of the Flower Moon is in the 29th place. So it's. One hundred and forty-five million dollars, which is a lot for like this kind of this kind of film. But uh, okay, I don't I don't think it's like one of the five best films of the year because I have to look at it. But I right. enjoyed I enjoyed in Indiana Jones. Uh, I, oh yeah. I I was um, maybe because uh, you know. I had like the feeling that I was going to see a, a worse film, but I said, oh, it's an Indiana Jones film at the end of the day. And, uh, well, I think the the sequence with Indiana Jones riding a horse in the subway, and uh, I think everybody has uh, seen it uh, by now in the trailer or, yeah. or even in cinemas because it has been, of course, a huge success worldwide. Oh, well, it was, it was interesting for me. It's more interesting uh, about the sense of uh, action adventure it portrays than uh, well the visual effects or if in this sequence Harrison Ford is John or is not John and you know um, Tyson we need yeah. I, I'm it's not going fun. to spoil anything but we need a film in which love wins and in this film love wins. But wins uh, a lot, <laughs> so I I like that. Yes, that's... yeah. I think that's what I appreciated most about this one was uh, that they were willing to 
give the character a bit more depth and yeah. the background and history and uh, that informed his kind of sullenness at mm -hmm. the beginning yeah. and um, see, see him sort of evolve throughout uh, mm -hmm. the film. Um, and as you say, yeah, the action sequences in the subway, they're, they're just exhilarating. And um, there's nothing, there's nothing that I think brings people together more than, you know, punching Nazis. So yes, <laughs> and, and you have Mats Mikkelsen, but uh, as they have a lot of a lot of money, Mats Mikkelsen is the bad guy once again. But well, anyway, Mats Mikkelsen, I know. Yes, you know, I yeah. I. Uh, I love so much his film Drunk when I saw it at uh, San Sebastian that I yeah. ended my review uh, inventing, singing a song for Mats Mikkelsen, saying he's the, the best. Oh yeah, oh he's one of the best. He's, he can do so much just with a, you know, a slight move of the mouth or, you know, yeah. acting, acting with his eyes. Um, in Hannibal, he's yeah. uh, an absolute like monster, mm -hmm. um, but in total control <laughs> for the most part. Yeah, yeah. Um, just that that kind of uh, embodiment of um, evil. Um, yeah. I think he pulls that off really, really well, and why he's so. I think prone to taking care, taking on roles where his behavior could be questionable, mm -hmm. or we may not know the full uh, intention behind yeah. it. Like, um, yeah. well, the one about the the, the molesting the student. Yeah. Um, oh. The yeah. one he won the the best actor at Cannes for. Yeah, um, it, it was in. I remember in the title in Spanish is like the chase. Or the hunt, no. the hunt, the, the hunt, hunt. Yeah. the hunt. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think he he he's in on the 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 sort of joke that you know he 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 looks a little bit uh, he, he he looks a little off putting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But they're they're completely completely full, fully fleshed out. Uh, human characters like um, maybe except for Harry Potter but um, yeah you know I think he's working in the principle make one for me and make one for them kind of thing so uh, <laughs> can't really you know knock him for that absolutely so Tyson uh, Tyson <laughs> Dr. Tyson Stewart, that's your profile, Nipissin University. Uh, there we can um, learn with you about uh, lots of things, but I think it's uh, very important what you're doing that's uh, conveying the different meanings, the different layers of culture and of mm -hmm. indigenous culture, because, uh, well, there's a long way, a long way to go, maybe. That's my final question until we can say, okay, now there's truth, there's reconciliation, and there's healing with uh, you indigenous people. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's all happening at once. Mm -hmm. Even the, you know, not so great behavior, um, the failures to listen to indigenous communities, mm -hmm. uh, the c continual appropriation of indigenous culture, and yeah. um, I think the the good progressive um, uh, sort of moves are happening. Unfortunately, at the same time that all the mm -hmm. other stuff is still going on, but at least we have more support, more awareness, um, more, I think, feeling uh, free to tell our stories. Mm -hmm. And and if that 
if that support um, remains through, you know, the filmmakers we have, um, the financial support, CBC, uh, Indigenous Screen Office, um, if we can still keep making films, uh, I think people will become uh, more resilient and more um, mm -hmm. uh, likely to want to tell their stories. And there's so many stories in uh, Indigenous communities that have not been told. I said that was the last one, but I was lying. It's, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I must confess this character. Uh, the problem with the pretendians. Uh, did you have a problem like that? Did you see Buffy? Because I think that the last impact, last shot, has been Buffy Saint Marie, which who, who was worldwide famous. And this, uh, you were talking about CBC. This CBC uh, report, uh, well, question like uh, her identity. What's that for for you as an indigenous person? Um. Buffy was, uh, is uh, a source of just pride and inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, her music meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, was often the catalyst to... Um, find out more about um, indigenous cultures from all over uh -huh. North America. Uh -huh. um, I love her song, um, Darling Don't Cry. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like, uh, you know, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Uh -huh. um, uh, just the amazing output Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what she experienced when she was young with her Massachusetts family. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they told her, according to her, her mother told her she was adopted. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know other than taking a blood test to compare her DNA with those yeah. of her Massachusetts family how else she could definitively uh, prove that she was adopted, in fact, mm -hmm. and not uh, of European ancestry. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very strange thing to want to, or to, to fake an identity like that for such a long period of time. Um, And so I, I, I don't know the truth, mm -hmm. but um, I think a lot of people uh, would like the truth yep. to come out. And, um, but uh, <laughs> in fact, we have to support indigenous artists and, uh, awesome. And if, if it comes out that she's not indigenous mm -hmm. and she created, fabricated a kind of background that um, uh, allowed her to claim indigeneity, mm -hmm. uh, then I, I would say we have to just kind of, you know, turn our attention, turn our love toward other people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In any case, I think uh, this uh, shows how important is it uh, to portray indigenous cultures, to call the attention about indigenous culture, what it really is, and um, to, that's, that's what I think, to question ourselves if we are... Um, showing we are conveying to the world an accurate image of what the indigenous culture is because sometimes it's mediated it's mediated through people who happen to not being 
indigenous and not consulting. Well, as you said, in the case of Scorsese, he had consultants he cared about really portraying accurately. And uh, I think it's uh, important when you're showing something about it, going to the source and, uh, well, like uh, um, documenting everything and showing everything with the Maybe with the accuracy you have to have when you research as a, as a doctor, when you do yeah, like your research articles and when you publish your research, you do like a, a door um, study. And uh, in the case of uh, indigenous cultures or for any culture, we should be very careful always. And uh, if sometimes you say something or you do something that's not correct well you apologize and you state oh this was incorrect i have done it um, i have said it the other way i have asked and this happened to be different but uh, well it's very important to um, go out and search for the truth as hard as we can because other people like politicians or, or who knows who there are also always trying to show us some different thing. Uh, Buffy is an, was an inspiration for, for everybody. Let's uh, hope it's clear. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, these cases of uh, pretendians uh, show us, I think, that what we need to know more is about uh, real First Nations or real indigenous people. Yeah, and just to accept that we're all very different. We all have different uh, backgrounds, different experiences. Mm -hmm. We're not all a part of like some sort of pan-indigenous identity. Absolutely. Uh, our traditions and our families lived very different lives. Mm -hmm. uh, to those, you know, out west or uh, in... Um, mm -hmm. In the United States, uh, even amongst uh, Anishinaabe communities, yep. there are vast differences in terms of um, how um, how like the co colonial state mm -hmm. uh, interfered with um, our ability to uh, connect with one another mm -hmm. to retain and hold on to our uh, languages and values. Um, in some ways, I feel really blessed that um, we have a very strong community in Tomogamy um, that love the land and that protect mm -hmm. the land and mm -hmm. that uphold um, such a uh, high standards for mm -hmm. governance and for mm -hmm. um, for the lifestyle of our people. And um, I feel very blessed also that I have on both sides of my family, a lot of people um, who support me and um, who are still still here and um, and the and even though I was, uh, disconnected until I was an adult with my Anishinaabe family. Um, although, you know, I always knew who they were and they were yeah. uh, a part of my life, but not to the extent that they are now. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that the people can reconnect in their way. Um, and in, in their, on their terms, mm -hmm. um, just, um, so, so <laughs> it, it really reinforces the, the idea that we have to, um, be, be proud of who, of where we come from and the, um, the people who were there to support us mm -hmm. um, and including, you know, the land mm -hmm. um, that, you know, provided the health and provided values yeah. and knowledge 
and um, and a way of looking at the world uh, that I think is more holistic and and healthier um, than a kind of disconnected existence. Mm-hmm. And to to bring it all the way back to the beginning at the uh, of the land acknowledgement issue. Yeah. is um, I would prefer that people introduce themselves instead mm-hmm. of doing a land acknowledgement where they speak mm-hmm. on behalf of this thing, the land, that is very kind of ambiguous uh, most of the time. Um, I am, you know, Tyson Stewart and Disney Kass, Atik and Dodum, Tamagami First Nation and Dujaba. Um, I'm doing this sort of in reverse, but it's... Uh, expectation in indigenous communities that you tell people where you're from and who your family Mm -hmm. and what community you're from and it kind of gives them a sense of um you know how you got here (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i think settlers should do the same thing i think we're all interested in knowing Mm -hmm. about where you came from your family Mm -hmm. history Uh, the circumstances maybe that uh, brought Mm -hmm. you here onto Indigenous lands and how you see your kind of life playing out and the responsibilities toward um, the the original stewards of this country Mm -hmm. um, that still hold so many rights and defend so much land that... um, that we really can't afford to see, you know, more of it taken. Mm -hmm. Uh, We we can't, we can't afford to be living in a dystopia. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I like, you know, how do we share those responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely, I like a, a lot what you just said. I, I'm about to say I am Antonio Pelayo Barceló. I am from Spanish ancestry, but Cuban ancestry also from my parent, father and my maternal grandmother. And uh, I came here to know people as uh, Dr. Tyson Stewart, to know, more, uh, to know more about this land and about uh, cinema and about uh, culture. Mm, <clears throat> I don't know exactly if I came to know more. I can tell I came to know you, but getting to know you, uh, I think it's uh, always uh, learning. And that's important because one thing is teaching and the other thing is is learning. And today we learn a lot. I had to be at another place, but I warned them that I'll be late, that there were things that were important. I think we <laughs> were talking that we were we're going to, well, we will be one hour at most. It's been like uh, two hours, uh, So, but Escocese is uh, three hours and a half, so it's not, not to worry. And, uh, well, I think it's been a very, very interesting review, a very interesting talk with you, Tyson. It was my absolute pleasure to uh, come back uh, and and participate um, and to talk with you about a shared passion uh, of this storytelling medium that I think does open up the world and does offer us more perspectives and that um, that's an ongoing uh, journey. Yes. And yes. I'm I'm very happy to have uh, met you. Me too. Me too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tyson. We'll be in touch. We'll uh, well. Mm, Tyson, you are assistant professor, Nipissing University. Uh, we've seen the web page through this uh, broadcast. But uh, anyway, as I usually tell you in Spanish, in French, or whatever. Cinema is a very important medium. I think you, uh, Tyson, are an example of what I, we were talking about before broadcasting, that is teaching cinema is important, but teaching through cinema and learning through cinema. And uh, Coreda, for instance, um, getting to show us how different perspectives are in life, it's important. Because at the end, 
the best best cinema in the world is the 